I'm really excited to, to be part of this panel. I, I was waiting for the conference before it was canceled. This is to me something that's very, I'm very passionate about. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my I'm the manager of business development for Fink Machine. We are a supplier of, of biomass heating equipment. But prior to that, I worked for approximately 10 years doing biomass heating development and community energy. And so within my community, I was also an elected official. So I, I really have a passion for what communities are looking to do and what they're able to do and really how much they can influence what's going on. So further to that, for our panel, we're gonna be talking to a number of people who are sort of the key actors when you're looking in your community around driving forward projects within the bioeconomy. For right now, we're gonna start by going to Leslie Grew, who's the Chief Administrative Officer for the District of Clearwater. I've known Leslie for a number of years now. She's been the CAO in Clearwater since 2008. She is also a Master Municipal Clerk as awarded by the International Institute of Municipal Clerks. So Leslie, I'll let you take it away and kind of share what your experiences have been with the District of Clearwater and what you guys are doing within the bioeconomy. Thank you. I'm not sure who puts on my screen, but um, I'll start going here. <clears throat> Go ahead, Leslie. I'm trying to. <laughs> well, there we go. Okay, I'm a little bit short here. <clears throat> so the District of Clearwater incorporated in 2007. So we're a new. We're actually a very new municipality. We signed on to the Climate Action Charter for BC in 2009. We have a population of 2,400. Uh, we developed uh, an energy emissions plan in 2012 to understand where we could go as far as sustainability. So we immediately looked at sustainability in our community. We completed a green energy scan in 2012 as well, where in both of those scans, we found that uh, bioenergy chips, <clears throat> uh, wood chips in particular, was the most likely thing for us to move forward with. In the green energy scan, we also identified uh, geotherm as another supply for us, uh, then we established a fourth year working group because as earlier panelists have talked about um, being involved with the fourth sector is very important to this whole process. That uh, working group has licensees, uh, local stakeholders and our local community forest on the board. Part of the discussions that we have there are um, actions to utilize local wood waste to generate our heat. The district's uh, council's strategic plan also identifies energy savings through green energy initiatives. Our success story, um, we have two of them. So Dutch Lake Community Centre, which was a renovated school that had been closed for 10 years. Working with Dave Dubois, we commissioned through the Wood Waste to Heat project, um, a business case analysis. We looked at this building, which is 2,200 square feet. And we also looked at the RCMP station, which is right adjacent to us. And that's how we chose the 150 kilowatt boiler system. We went through a procurement process. Uh, we, then we commissioned the system into the fall of 2015. I wanted to note that when we, before we went onto the system, we were using around 68 to 69,000 liters of propane to the cost of about $41,000 annually. Our partners in this project for this facility were Canadian Forest Products, <clears throat> um, the Community Forest and, and Fink Machines. So uh, Canfor provided us the chips for free because uh, they had a mill just down the road. The Community Forest gave us a loan of 100,000 and then later they uh, forgave 60,000 of it and Fink um, worked with us to build the system. The business case had an estimated a payback um, for a $200,000 capital outlay of about 8.7 years, paying around $35 a bone dry ton. Our actuals for this facility, now that we've had some years under our belt, <clears throat> the capital outlay was $285,000. Payback is, we're still at 8.7 because we've had to do a couple of adjustments in there um, with the, uh, when, where the chips get loaded into, we do some changes. So after grants of 80,000, um, and sorry, that's 8.7 years, we use an average of 51 bone dry trend here to heat this facility for 2,200 square feet. 
our annual propane savings is around 33,000 and our GHG savings is over 80 ton. We also looked at the pellets as well for this system, but we went with the chips. The North Thompson Sportsplex, which is our local um, <clears throat> hockey arena, and it also has a curling rink in it. We purchased a 220 kilowatt biosystem for that one. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for that is at that time, we were negotiating to have the uh, affordable housing facility that was being built right beside us to come on. Um, they couldn't wait for that. So they ended up going um, through electric heat, which is really unfortunate, but they are looking at a second phase of 32 units. So we'll continue that discussion. This facility was using around 72,000 liters of um, <clears throat> propane and basically operating from mid-August to end of March. We completed our site plan and um, the procurement process and commissioned in 2018. Again, we worked with Fink, um, and in this time we worked with the interior um, plumbing and heating and um, for the mechanical part of it. We partnered with the Ministry of Energy. So through the KELP program, we were given a $160,000 grant. We again worked with Canfor, only this time we're paying for the chips. Community Forest provided a $300,000 grant and the Thompson Nicola Regional District gave us 24,000 in gas tax <clears throat> as a partner. And then the, um, again, Fink Machines is who we partnered with on this. The business case estimated a payback for the 602,000 capital outlay about nine and a half years. We built an in-ground bunker on this system because we learned from the last one that the, the, the uh, above ground was a, a bit of a challenge for holding a lot of chips. And so then as far as the actuals go uh, outside of the business case, the capital outlay ended up being uh, 583,000. So a little bit less than we anticipated. The payback is at five and a half years after the grants of 484,000. The average bone diet ton being used is about 100,000 to heat a 36,000 square foot building. Annual propane savings is around 25. Seven, uh, we are paying some money to haul the chips now. And um, so that's uh, reduced some of our anticipated savings, but our GHG savings we're estimating is around 190 ton for this facility. Learnings and successes. Our learnings are that um, <clears throat> risk managing was really important for the projects because we ran into some glitches, you know, weather and various different things that usually can happen, planning for the what ifs, engineering and sizing. So for the sportsplex, because we have three different um, uh, boiler system rooms, we had to make sure that we engineered for those three systems to be able to hook into the biomass boiler. Uh, chip dumping facility, uh, we ended up, we have now built a um, chip storage facility for 9,000 square feet, that way we can make sure that we are able to dry our chips. No rocks. When we first started, we were getting, um, we were having some significant issues because we were getting chips from the can for mill <clears throat> and um, they were scooping up some hefty rocks that our system didn't like putting through. Our successes were the relationship with Fink, our supplier, um, can for, uh, who has now left our valley. So that brought some challenges that I'll speak about in a minute. Partnerships. Um, we built a comfort level to manage future projects, secured longer term chip supply. So what we've done now that Canfor left uh, our valley, we actually worked through the forestry working group and we've uh, secured a salvage logger in our local community who is providing, we signed a three year contract with them. When we were looking at this, the interesting thing was we were looking um, at up to $200 a cubic meter to have chips hauled into our community which is not sustainable. So then we were looking at the plan B, which would have been to go to pellets. But we actually secured with our local salvage logger for 50,000 a cubic meter supply and deliver to our facilities. So to me, that was a great success. We are always looking at creating sustainability in our community. <clears throat> so I believe this project, these two projects um, addressed two of the four pillars of sustainability, environment, by reducing our carbon footprint and the economic by 
costing, uh, lowering the cost operations of our facilities and also um, jobs within our community. So what's next for us? As I mentioned earlier, we built a chip storage unit. Goal is to establish a district energy. So it was great to hear the panelists earlier, made some good notes on things to think about. We would then supply the second phase of the affordable housing and the Thompson Nicola Regional District Library. We can actually do that through the North Thompson Sportsplex boiler size at this moment. We would then upgrade and extend to supply the Jim Pattison development, which is in the picture at the bottom left. That's a new um, <clears throat> strip mall that was built with four buildings. You can't see the credit union in the Tim Hortons. The local hospital, which is to the right, um, which in 2012 was using $140,000 of operating money to supply the heat to their building. So we're hoping that we can work with them. And then the Raft River Elementary School, which is just down the hill. And we talked about <clears throat> when the sewer line was put in, I tried to secure some money to put the pipe in for the heat system at the same time, but that didn't succeed. However, we are looking at expansion to our sewer system across the highway and down into another part of our community. So that'll be another area where I will heavily pursue being able to lay the pipe at the same time for a district energy system. Our adventure is always here. Thank you very much, Leslie. Really great presentation. Um, just a little note you had in your slides that, that it was 100,000 bone dry tons. I think it was actually supposed to be 100 bone dry tons. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes, no. I'm, not, I'm not technical savvy when it comes to that part. I rely on my staff. No problem. Thank you very much for your presentation. At this time, we would like to turn it over to Chris Klesnikoff. Chris is the COO for Klesnikoff Lumber, which is a local lumber manufacturer, as well as other products based out of Nelson, British Columbia. They are a family owned company. Chris himself was recently named one of the top 10 under 40 by Canadian Forest Industries. Um, we're just waiting for Chris to get control of the slide deck here. And we should be good to go. Are you there, Chris? Yep, thanks, David. All right, take it away, Chris. Just, uh, this working. all right, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit today uh, on mass timber. So um, as David touched on here, uh, we're a family owned business. Uh, myself and my sister represent the fourth generation of our company. So we've been in business for 81 years. My great grandfather and his two brothers started the business um, back in the uh, early 1930s. And uh, we started by harvesting firewood, um, grew into a mountainside operation, and then uh, kind of grew into more of a specialty sawmill that really focused on products throughout North America, as well as export, and uh, continued to always strive for value added. So we added a remanufacturing plant in the uh, late 1990s that focused on products uh, like interior paneling, flooring, um, siding, moldings, and trims. Um, and then we were excited to start our journey in 2014 towards uh, building our new mass timber facility. So in, the, in those years, um, myself and my sister being fourth generation, we really wanted to make sure that we continue to grow our business and have the ability to pass that on to generations to come. And, and we, knew, we knew we needed to continue to integrate downstream. Um, so we did look at a, a bunch of different opportunities. We looked at co-generation, uh, we looked at pellet manufacturing, but uh, ultimately we settled on mass timber being the best fit for our company. And uh, it really matched the, uh, the forest that we harvest. So what makes us unique uh, in North America uh, specifically in mass timber is our full integration. So first and foremost, we are farmers of the land. Sustainability and forest management is what drives our business. And uh, what you see right now um, in a lot of manufacturers in North America for, for mass timber and CLT is it kind of starts uh, more towards the middle of the chain where you're already buying a, a wood product and you're then trying to, to turn it into a mass timber finished process. So for us, we have the ability to go right back to our, our forest lands. You know, when we're harvesting our timber, you know, we get an understanding of where we want to put that log, where is it, where is its best end use, whether it be mass timber, whether it be solid wood, whether it be domestic or export markets. So we really do offer the full chain and uh, including up uh, into uh, installation as well on some of our projects. We do live in the beautiful area of, of the West Kootenays uh, here in British Columbia. So we're blessed with a really uh, diverse forest. Um, we have some great elevations. So what it allows is multiple species in our area. So our sawmill um, alone harvests over 10 different species. And uh, what that has allowed our area as well is to be 
more protected from, from some of the forest health issues that have plagued British Columbia. So having such a diverse uh, uh, blend of species mixes has sheltered us from the pine beetle epidemic and, and even some of the different wildfire issues. So it is something we're fortunate of, um, but we do pride ourselves on being able to harvest really within that 100 mile diet. So some of the things for our business, um, you know, we replant three seedlings for every one timber that's harvested. Um, and we are really early adapters of technology, even on our harvesting side. So we use a lot of LIDAR to map the land base um, in a lot of our pre-planning stages. Um, we're also trying to forecast what we see as future climate in the areas so that we're planting the right seedlings, you know, whether it be uh, drought resistant or, or uh, different elevation changes. So we're really trying to be progressive on our forest management side of our business. We're fortunate to have two locations uh, very close to each other. So within a, a five kilometer radius, um, we have our sawmill and our mass timber facility. So we're able to shuttle our products back and forth really effectively. Um, and and uh, combined, we have over 40 acres of, uh, of working land. From a sawmill perspective, that is really the core of our business and what drove our, our initial, uh, our company. Um, we're about a mid-size operation in comparison to some of the other larger sawmills across British Columbia. And what that allows us to do is really specialize. Um, so we are able to really extract the most amount of value out of every, every tree that we're harvesting. And like I said, we capitalize a lot on both domestic markets as well as export. Um, Japan is, has been and continues to be one of our biggest markets. And uh, there's a lot of specialty Douglas fir specific projects that we're able to supply. So in uh, 2019, we broke ground on our brand new mass timber facility. It's a two or it's 110,000 square feet. Um, the plant is heated with uh, biomass. So we do burn our, our chips and our shavings residuals to, to heat the building. It's a 950 kilowatt system. Um, it's something that was important to us being that we were progressing down the line. Um, the heat within the building is important to our uh, manufacturing operations and what better way to heat the building than with our own uh, biomass system. This is just an animation of what you'd see inside our plant. So we're very proud of the facility. Um, like I said, it was a six year journey for us to really research and build the plant. It's highly automated. So we've been in our community for 81 years. Um, we've grown, this plant has helped us grow our employment by an additional 50, uh, 50 people. But the majority of these roles are, are, are more your technical aspiration roles. So there really are only 20 to 25 labor positions within the plant. The rest of the roles really encompass um, engineering, 3D modeling, project managers, project uh, coordinators. So it's a really kind of a diverse um, uh, business model that we've been able to provide. The majority of our equipment did come from, uh, from Europe. So just a couple images here, we finger join our products and can create up to 60 foot long lamellas. Um, and then we use our adhesives, two-part adhesives to create both of our glue lamb and our, and our CLT products. This would be a photo of uh, some of our glue lamb or GLT panels heading into our high frequency press. So again, within our facility, we really did embrace technology where we're using high frequency to cure all of our products um, instead of kind of your traditional uh, cold set applications. Um, our CLT line is in the middle of our plant. It's really kind of the core of, of this facility. And uh, again, we can build panels upwards of 12 feet by 60 feet in total dimension and up to 15 inches in total thickness. So lots of different varieties, whether it be for, for horizontal panels, so flooring, ceiling applications, wall applications. And then we try to get creative as well, whether it be uh, bridge applications or other type of uses where, uh, where timber can really uh, uh, perish. So we are really focused on CLTs, our core volumes, but we are able to produce glue lamb and GLT as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a really diverse species mix. So we're, we're harvesting products, spruce, pines, Douglas fir, larch, hemlock, white fir. Um, and we really have, are able to um, manage them all into our different mass timber product lines. We're currently certified in both Canada and the U, uh, US for all of our product lines. And uh, we're currently working on our certifications to be able to offer these products into Japan as well. Our products are certified sustainable, so we can offer it a, in either an FSC chain of custody, a PEFC or SFI. So we're able to achieve the lead platinum goals or gold platinum goals that a lot of these um, great projects are chasing. We are um, a lot more than just a manufacturing plant. So we do get a lot involved heavily in the design assist approach. So a lot of, uh, we got a great team here that gets into helping model these buildings. So we take on at times uh, the structural engineering of the facility or the, of the, the project at hand the connection details, 
um, and then actually uh, working through how the building is going to be installed as well. Um, so as I touched on there, installation is another factor that we get involved with, um, really job specific. Uh, here's a little bit of an outline on some of the projects we're currently working on. So in the top uh, left, that's a six story multifamily project in uh, British Columbia. So that's a nice hybrid project where it's actually a light frame wall system with CLT floor plates. The picture in the uh, top right is uh, an exciting job we're working on right now in uh, Victoria. So that's a 12 story multifamily and it's a complete mass timber structure. So glue lamb um, with CLT um, as its core structure base. In the uh, bottom right, we're working on a student residence in, uh, in the city of Toronto. So a nine story student residence for Humber College. And that, uh, that is also gonna be a, a complete mass timber structure glue lamb with CLT. Well, we're also working on a student residence at the University of Victoria. Um, and we delivered a great project to a university in Boston earlier this year that again, focused on a combination of, uh, of timber, um, glue lamb and panels. So we're really kind of diverse. We are believers that there's a right fit for everything. Um, timbers, timber's a great product, but it's sometimes, you know, having that hybrid design is, is the best way to construct the building where you are, you know, working in partnership with steel um, and concrete um, just to make sure to, to really identify what the best outlet is. So that's a quick update on, uh, on who we are. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Uh, just encourage people, if they do have any questions, please feel free to put them into the question and answer section. Um, and we'll be getting to those at the end of this session, time permitting. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Gord Chipman. Gord is the forest manager for Alkali Resource Management or ARM. ARM is owned by the Eskedem First Nation and manages their woodlot and timbers community forests. Um, so maybe Gord, I'll just turn it over to you without any ado. Okay, thanks Dave. Uh, so uh, Elk, we're located in a place called Alkali Lake uh, where the Eskedem people live. Uh, we're located about 50 kilometers south of Williams Lake on the east side of the Fraser River. Um, we manage about 80,000 hectares of land uh, through community forests or woodland tenures and um, our goal is to optimize the lands and have full utilization on our lands. That's always been our goal here. Uh, the Eskedem people live at Alkali Lake. It's one of 17 bands in the Swatman Nation. There's about 1,200 band members and about 600 people live on the main um, IR reserve land number one. Um, in managing these lands in the past, we've wasted a lot of energy. I mean, th this is very common and a lot of people have seen this all over the province and, and all over the world, this goes on. Well, this was our normal and um, we wanted to make a change to this. Um, so we, uh, about five years ago, we went down the process of trying to harness the energy from our debris piles that our, our timber harvesting operations creates. Uh, this is our com main community at, at Alkali Lake and all the little blue dots show all the different buildings that we are currently now heating with our district energy system. Um, so how did we do this? Uh, what did we do? Well, about five years ago, we started researching to figure out how we could um, harness this energy. So it, it all started, um, Dominic helped me out. He lined me up with some people in Austria. We were going, uh, our family was heading over to Austria and, and Hungary to visit some family there. And um, Dominic lined me up with uh, Christiane Eger at uh, Energy Parvan there. And, and uh, they toured me around and showed me their district heating systems that they have there. Um, from that, uh, we decided that uh, we needed to review what energy possibilities we had. So we looked at solar, we looked at wind, uh, we, we figured out uh, different hydro dam possibilities and where we ended up was bioenergy had the best bang for our buck. And so that's where we went. Um, then we applied for federal funding and uh, to be able to build a biomass plant. Then we started working with FP Innovations and they guided us um, on what we needed to look at. And we, we worked with uh, Marion Marskanu there 
and he was instrumental in helping us go the right direction. Um, so we, we went out and we bought uh, a chipper. We were thinking we'd be able to use this for some of our wildfire risk reduction projects. And, and once we get the biomass plant going, then we'd be able to use it for that. So here's a Heisohack chipper that we bought, uh, brought it straight from Germany. And uh, it makes these beautiful little chips that are between five centimeters and less. Um, so it's perfect for our bioenergy plant. Um, then we got some funding and then we started uh, breaking ground. So here we are, here's a picture showing the ceremony. Community was involved in with breaking ground so that we can get started on, on the right footing. Um, then we started building the plant. Uh, we tended it out. We, uh, we ended up installing, uh, I think we got three rolling T4 boilers. Now they're uh, rated for 150 kilowatts. Um, and then we started burying the lines all around the community. And here, here's a picture of a number of our band members that were involved with uh, doing the work and, and getting the lines in the ground. So this was, this was all in 2018 when we, we started doing this. And um, this is a picture from our boiler room in our main forestry office. We, we got a couple of propane Beastman boilers on the right hand side for backup or for when the warmer conditions are happening. And, and then the, you see all the piping and uh, you see in the bottom left of the screen is uh, that's where the, the piping from the district energy system comes in, in through the wall. Um, we've, uh, we built a, a shop with uh, radiant heating and it works off the, the district energy system. This was a picture from last year and, and now it's fully functional. Um, but we also, we do a number of other things. So we, we produce a lot of firewood. Um, here's our, our, one of our firewood cutters that we have. It's, uh, located at the plywood plant in Williams Lake and, and behind, uh, the firewood cutter, there is a big row of uh, uh, spin outs from the plywood plant. So they, they couldn't use it unless they go and chip it. And so we take it and we, we make firewood and we, we produce two, 300 uh, cord a month with that and supply a lot of firewood to the community. We also, uh, we got, we got involved with the provincial funding for, um, for biomass and, and uh, addressing a lot of the other debris piles that we have. Um, the interesting thing about this is our district energy system, even though we're, only, we're heating uh, 13 different buildings in the community, we only consume 500 tons a year. We have easily 50 to 100 tons on every landing that we have out there. And we can easily produce about uh, 30,000 tons a year. So we needed to do something else. So here we are, we got a big CBI grinder, one of our contractors has, and, uh, and the bottom picture is a picture of uh, the surge pile that we created. We, um, we had over 10,000 tons there this winter. Um, so right now we're selling a lot of our bioenergy or biomass to Williams Lake, where we have a cogeneration plant and there's a pellet plant there. And we have uh, contracts with, with the companies in, in Williams Lake. Um, interesting enough, this grinder that you see in the picture, it'll produce about 500 tons in two days. Whereas that other little chipper, it would, it would take a couple months, but, uh, so different, um, different solutions to our bioenergy and, and, uh, addressing what we're doing in the community forest. That's all I got. Let's turn my mute off and that works better. Thanks very much, Gord. Appreciate it. Thanks for staying on time. I see some questions starting to, to pop up. Please feel free to review those questions and upvote them if you think that's a question that you'd like to have answered. And depending on how it goes for time, we will do that. So our next presenter is going to be Kevin Hudson. Now, I'd just like to say Kevin stepped in at very short notice. We got a notification yesterday afternoon that our original presenter was not going to be available. Uh, so Kevin has agreed to step in. He is a thermal energy manager for Interior Health. He's been working in the uh, utility field for a number of years now, primarily uh, in Saskatchewan, and he's just recently relocated to, to, um, 
to Kelowna, but he's going to talk a little bit about what Interior Health is doing right now as regards to bioenergy and, and the bioeconomy. So maybe what I'll ask is, Kevin, if you can uh, take control and we'll get you to go ahead. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, David. And I'm uh, pleased to be uh, speaking with everyone here this morning. Um, before I uh, get into our biomass projects, I just wanted to give a quick overview of Interior Health. And uh, Interior Health is one of the health authorities in uh, the province of British Columbia. We own and operate 310 hospitals, health and residential care facilities throughout BC's interior. This is in 60 communities, including seven First Nations. And I am speaking to you today from Kelowna, which is in the traditional territory of the Sioux Okanagan Nation. Interior Health has a service area of 215,000 square kilometers, and that's roughly the size of the state of Minnesota. And we operate with a annual budget of about $2.6 billion. Uh, we are a government organization, and uh, the government of BC uh, has made climate action a high priority for all government agencies. And uh, specifically um, for our the buildings that we operate, we have a mandate to reduce our annual greenhouse gas emissions 40% by 2030. And so that's the motivation behind the biomass projects that I'll uh, talk about today. We also have a mandate to reduce um, or to be 80% more energy efficient by 2032, as well as to be net zero energy ready by 2032. And so we believe that uh, once we achieve that uh, target, we can achieve actual net zero energy by uh, using renewable energy sources such as biomass. So to help us meet this, these goals, um, we, are, we do receive a lot of support from the provincial government. And uh, every year we spend about $18 million on energy bills. Um, that's for electricity and for heating energy. And uh, a portion of that, about a million dollars a year, is uh, our actual carbon offset payment. So it's a form of a carbon tax based on the energy that we consume. And we're able to apply to get that money back through what's called the Carbon Neutral Capital Program through the Ministry of Health if we um, deliver energy management projects like I'll uh, talk about here uh, today. We also uh, are, are supported by uh, our utility partners um, through Fortis BC and BC Hydro. Uh, Fortis BC is our main natural gas supplier who supplies most of our facilities throughout the province. Um, and they also provide electricity for about half of our facilities. And the other half are uh, powered by BC Hydro. So uh, this slide talks about two of our biomass boiler projects. And these are, uh, these are small boilers, um, package boilers, uh, about 500 kilowatt uh, size, roughly 50 boiler horsepower each. And uh, the uh, community of, communities of Lillooet and Golden are, um, I, I would say, remote uh, mountainside communities that do not have natural gas service. And so uh, the main heating fuel has been propane. Uh, both of these hospitals are about 6,000 square meters, so roughly 70,000 um, square feet. And uh, they use about uh, just over 5,000 gigajoules per year in uh, propane. So that's about 5,200 million BTU and uh, about 215,000 liters of propane, which is equivalent to about 145,000 cubic meters of natural gas. And uh, by uh, using uh, biomass, and so the, uh, the top picture here on the slide is the facility in Lillooet, and the bottom picture is in uh, Golden. So uh, both of these 
boilers are now in operation, and we're able to offset our uh, propane costs. Um, the uh, Lillooet facility offsets about 70% of our propane consumption, and in Golden about 90%, um, by using uh, uh, wood pellets for, for these boilers. And so um, we pay about, uh, well, we pay 72 cents a liter for propane, which is the equivalent of about $28.50 per gigajoule. It's a very expensive fuel. The pellets um, are about $12 per gigajoule, so a significant savings by fuel switching to uh, woody biomass. And just to, to give you a frame of reference, natural gas is about $6 a gigajoule. So it's still more expensive than natural gas, but significantly cheaper than propane. Uh, the capital cost for the Lillooet project was just over a million dollars, and for Golden, um, about $1.3 million. And the payback, um, nine years for Lillooet, and a, uh, about double that for Golden. And, uh, we would expect or hope that uh, the capital cost for this equipment, as the market continues to develop, will come down over time and help with those paybacks. I'd really like to see them um, down in the uh, below five year uh, range um, so we could uh, deploy this technology in many other facilities. And then the, uh, the stack bar chart on the bottom of the slide uh, just shows our propane, uh, quarterly propane consumption for the two facilities. So the Lillooet is shown in green, and Golden is shown in the uh, the blue or purple on the on the bottom. So Lillooet was commissioned in uh, second quarter of 2019, and you can see uh, the drastic reduction in propane consumption. And then Golden followed uh, late last year. We're also uh, uh, used, tied into the uh, district energy system, which also uses wood biomass in the community of Enderby, that's just north of uh, Vernon, and that's a, a system that Fink operates. And uh, this uh, district energy system offsets uh, the use of natural gas for uh, district heating for that community. And so we do see a, uh, a carbon reduction there of about 140 tons per year by fuel switching to, to wood. Um, within our facility there uh, in, uh, in Enderby. And then we are uh, uh, currently working on another large, uh, well, uh, similar size 500 kilowatt uh, uh, biomass boiler in the uh, community of Invermere that uh, we hope to have uh, operational in 2021 and similar scale with about a 15 year payback. And so uh, this is my last slide, but just uh, speak uh, very quickly about the benefits and uh, some of the, uh, the lessons learned. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the primary uh, motivation for uh, fuel switching away from uh, fossil fuel to wood is a uh, reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, the combined uh, reduction for these four projects is about 1,100 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And that makes up about 2.5% of our um, annual greenhouse gas emissions for interior health. And so uh, by doing projects like this, we are taking steps toward that 40% carbon reduction by 2030. Um, as I mentioned, uh, capital cost uh, currently is, uh, is a bit of a hurdle. Um, and other lessons that we've learned, uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned it's important to negotiate long-term uh, supply contracts to lock in those fuel prices and uh, help help you achieve your payback. It's also important to properly size the boilers and make sure that they are uh, used in the proper application. And a great time to do a project like this is when uh, existing equipment is approaching uh, end of life. And then it's an easy decision to, uh, to do fuel switching at that point. And so uh, David, I'll, I'll turn it back to you now. Oops, let's unmute myself again. Thank you very much, Kevin, appreciate it. And thank you for staying on time. So at this point, we have a number of questions. Um, you may have noticed that some of our panelists have been gracious enough to answer the questions directly for those that have, pertain to themselves. That being said, we did have a couple of ones that we still would like to ask the, all the panelists. Um, 
coming from Gerald McDonald. He's kind of wondering, you know, what do the panelists see the linkages are between mass timber and, and bioheat? And, and I think that really ties to the, the, to the goal of this session in terms of understanding how all these different things kind of come together and, and stuff. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Chris first to kind of comment what he sees on the linkages, then we'll go to our other panelists. Sure, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's definitely a parity between the two. So I, I know locally, it's something that we, we work on quite a bit. So, um, you know, we're excited to be working on several local projects for community centers, um, you know, even some hospital upgrades, multifamily residencies, and where we can really influence the building design with mass timber and then also utilize our residual products to offer heat systems, you know, being that we have some firsthand experience with how the biomass heat systems work, um, you know, going to some of these builder developers or, or the local communities and being able to offer the complete package of the timber building with the biomass heat systems combined is something that's uh, pretty powerful. Um, at the same time, they're also, uh, you know, I, I did different business models as well, where, you know, a lot of our um, mass timber construction is focused towards um, more repetitive, large scale where you can offset um, you know, competing uh, product lines like concrete and steel. So there are a lot of um, urban densification projects that we work on there where, um, you know, maybe mass timber isn't as, uh, or uh, sorry, biomass isn't as relatively used as a, as a heat system. So Leslie, in your presentation, you, you talked a lot about the policy drivers that you guys had in place. Maybe what's your thoughts on sort of combination of mass timber, bioheat, and some of these other initiatives around the bioeconomy? One of, one of the primary things for us, because we strongly believe in doing this, is um, having capacity. <clears throat> so we need human resources to link all these together is one of the things. So we, um, I do it off the side of my desk, which isn't the best way to do this. Um, <clears throat> but we are looking forward. Uh, we are, it, it, have we been successful in getting more fuel mitigation funding? So we're hoping to be able to link with our log, uh, salvage logger and make sure that we can utilize that instead of burning. Um, I think it was Chris's presentation where he showed how they burnt a lot of the piles. Well, we did that in 2009, 10 and 11 and it was kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> so that's one of them. Um, and then what other question? Um, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll trick to ask Gord what, what you see because for yourselves and, and for the Eskedem Nation, you're looking at it in the bioeconomy, not only you locally, but also exporting the fiber to other consumers for usage. What's your thoughts on sort of the linkages between the, the mass timber, the bioheat, and how they all work together for low carbon? I, I definitely don't have a perspective on the mass timber part, but um, what we're quickly learning with the bio, bioenergy, anything we're selling into Williams Lake, we we do the the prices that we're getting for the material doesn't cover the costs and so that the transportation anything over an hour and a half to two hours from from the delivery point is is questionable whether we can even do it so um, in order for us to to continue delivering product to market either prices have to go up or there has to be more incentives or, or funding programs from the government. Okay, and, and Kevin, maybe you can comment on ultimately uh, what I'll say is a, a customer for both BioHeat and potentially CLT and some of these other things. What's your <coughs> take on, on what the role is in terms of what you think organizations like Interior Health would be doing around low carbon in, or, in incorporating these types of things? Um, yeah, so we, so we always uh, uh, try to try to balance uh, uh, the, the capital projects that we're doing with uh, with our operating costs, and so we're we're looking for the the very best opportunities. Uh, in the previous session, one of the speakers talked about the lowest hanging fruit, and so that's what we're trying to uh, to deliver first from a, from an energy management perspective. And so our our projects right now, as as you saw from the a bit of an economic snapshot that are very sensitive to uh, capital costs and fuel prices. And so um, you know, it, it, it's always a challenge, uh, but that's why it's so important to, uh, to negotiate those long-term supply contracts. Um, 
one of the other questions that was posed was about fuel debris. And so we're uh, we're actually uh, for the Lillooet facility. We're, we're purchasing uh, pellets from the community of Princeton, which is almost 300 kilometers from the site. Um, and so that that's a challenge. It's a long way to uh, to deliver fuel. Uh, that's 300 kilometers one way. And so uh, we'd also be sensitive to that uh, from from a real like a true carbon reduction perspective. It doesn't make sense to transport fuel over a long distance because um, that creates emissions as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kevin. Next question is, I'm just wondering if we can get the panelists to comment on the pros and cons of community owned and operated DE versus private. And maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Kevin to, to answer this question from the point of view of a, a client connecting to a private DE system and then maybe talk to Leslie and Gord about their experience with their community owned and, and selling providing heat to their own buildings. Um, sorry, Dave, I'm not quite uh, sure exactly what you're referring to. Uh... So what was some of the decision-making that went into interior health connecting to the district energy system? So what are the pros and cons for you guys in terms of connecting to that? Um, yeah, great question. So uh, in, in the uh, community of Enerby, um, that, uh, that, that facility, um, it's quite aged, and the uh, the existing boiler plant uh, was was nearing end of life, and so connecting with a highly reliable district energy system in the community did allow us to uh, avoid uh, additional capital investment in the boiler plant. Um, so that that's an important consideration. Okay, and Leslie or Gordon, either one of you like to comment on some of the pros and cons around sort of acting as a utility within your communities? I'll just do one really quick one. <clears throat> With the Dutch Lake Community Center, what um, because we were getting our chips for free, we actually reduced our propane costs from 40, average of 40,000 a year down to 1,800. The lowest one was $1,300. But now that we're <clears throat> back paying for our chips, we're still under $10,000. So we still have a significant savings just in the cost of, um, the fuel alone. Okay, Gord, would you like to add anything? Yeah, for for us, it's a it's a pride thing to to own the the district heating system ourselves and have control over it, be self sufficient without having to rely on any other entities. It it's a pride issue, um, security issue, really. So that, that's the biggest value for us. I see that's something that a, a number of the panelists are nodding their head to, and there's a sense of strong community in terms of what you guys are all doing. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll start from Leslie, seeing as you went first, I'll start with you and give you each 30 seconds to kind of wrap up your sum, some of the thoughts that you might have. Um, yeah, so go ahead, Leslie. So the key for us, of course, being a really small community and losing our major employer <clears throat> is to keep um, our systems sustainable keep our taxes uh, at a reasonable rate. So taxation is a big one. And then um, the carbon footprint, like we, we, you like, we are a forested community. We should be using our forest to heat our community. Okay, excellent. Chris? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, from a bio, biofuel standpoint, there's definitely lots of opportunity to continue to utilize the, uh, the fiber you know, throughout British Columbia and throughout Canada. Um, you know, but there's, you still have to consider costs and, and geographic locations. So, you know, we spent some time, we spent a lot of time in Europe and, and saw some fantastic systems there, but the densification is different, right? So to have enough users on the system and have access to the fuel at a, at a cost competitive um, situation is something that still needs to be always considered. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Gordon? You know, we, we have so much bioproduct out there that that's available and for our own use in the community right now, we're only gonna consume 500 tons a year. Maybe we'll expand it up to a thousand in the future, but we're producing over 30,000 tons a year with our debris piles. So the a district heating system is, is just a drop in the bucket for us. Um, we, we love it, it's great, but it, we need bigger solutions to deal with all the biomass that we create. Okay, and Kevin. Sure, thanks, David. Um, so you heard some of the challenges that we have uh, uh, with uh, energy and carbon targets, and 
to, to be able to meet those will require a, a very significant capital investment. And so uh, we'd love to um, uh, collaborate with the communities that we serve to, um, to try to deliver energy management in a more efficient way um, by partnering with the community. That's a win-win for, for everyone. Okay, thank you very much to all of our panelists. I'd just like to remind attendees that there will be a survey after the Rob's wrap-up comments, and I just encourage you to take advantage of that. And so now I'll turn it back over to Rob to finish this and take us home.